So, let me connect uh, with the discussion that we were having uh, last uh, time, uh, the previous discussion about the quantization of the Hall plateaus. So, this is the uh, effect that we have seen uh, that this is the, the quantum Hall effect or the quantized plateaus which it is famous for. Uh, so, uh, we have to understand these origin of these plateaus and uh, uh, how they are so robust to uh, disorder and impurities as they are. Uh, and uh, also we have to understand these green plots which represent the rho xx or the magneto resistance or the longitudinal resistance. Uh, so, let me just write that rho xy would be called as Hall uh, resistivity. Uh, and rho xx will be called as uh, one can call it as a longitudinal resistance or uh, resistivity uh, and or it is also called as a magneto resistivity basically the resistivity that arises uh, because of the magnetic field. And um, uh, so, these are uh, as you see the green plots actually uh, vanish most of the time excepting when the red curves show a jump from one plateau to another. Uh, then it sort of shoots up and then again goes to 0 uh, and it remains 0 till the, uh, the plateaus exist in the Hall conductivity. This is uh, uh, a quantum phenomena as uh, we have said earlier and we will be talking about this. Um, so, the quantum mechanical nature of the electrons in presence of a magnetic field uh, will have to be worked out and we have to understand how these plateaus arise and why they are so robust so much so that they actually give the benchmark of uh, resistance. Uh, the plateaus actually h over e square sets the scale of resistance which is 25.813 kilo ohm uh, and uh, we have to understand all that. But uh, before that uh, for one last time let me do the uh, the classical analysis in order to understand the behavior of a charged particle in a, a electromagnetic field or, or a magnetic field say. And um, we have of course, done this problem at equilibrium and we wanted to understand that uh, what happens or how the Hall voltage develops uh, in the transverse ages of the sample when there is a longitudinal current being sent uh, from one end to another. And um, that was a analysis that was done and at equilibrium when uh, the force vanishes. Uh, but we have not talked about uh, what is the trajectory of the uh, particle uh, in presence of an electromagnetic field. And this is important because uh, the trajectory uh, being actually a path that is followed by a particle, uh, a charged particle. Uh, should not really depend upon whether we are talking about classical mechanics or quantum mechanics. Um, of course, in quantum mechanics we uh, rarely discuss or uh, worry about uh, the trajectory of the particle for the reason that the trajectory is uh, uh, it is um, there is an uncertainty principle which is uh, underlying that and which governs the trajectory. So, let us look at the classical trajectory of a charged particle. And this is done with an intention that uh, we will be uh, dealing with a quantum mechanical system uh, soon. Okay. So, uh, let us um, talk about two cases, uh, the case one being uh, where there is no electric field uh, and uh, there is only a magnetic field which is uh, constant which is not equal to 0, it is finite and it is uh, uniform. Okay. Uh, so, this is the situation uh, one that is case one say. And um, the energy is constant. So, uh, please do not confuse between the electric field E and the energy. Energy is a scalar. So, energy is a constant uh, and um, energy is constant because of the reason that the power delivered uh, is equal to 0 which is uh, uh, nothing but uh, the low range force is V cross B and that is why this is equal to 0. So, we can write this as uh, MV. A dot a v dot which is equal to d dt of 
uh, half m v square and this is equal to uh, q into v dot v cross b which is equal to 0 ok. So, this is your uh, f dot v uh, because your f is the low range force when there is no electric field it is only the magnetic field will create a low range force. So, uh, so v dot v cross b equal to 0. Uh, the reason is simple this v cross b is a vector which is perpendicular to both v and b and that is why if you take a dot product with v it will give you 0 and that is why a ddt of half mv square equal to 0 which means half mv square equal to constant ok and this is what we mean by uh, the energy being a constant that is the only energy that is uh, left in the uh, problem. So, this um, you know uh, results in uh, separate equations or separate dynamics uh, for the longitudinal and the transverse direction. So, if you write your V to be having a parallel component and a perpendicular component and these dynamics are uncoupled or decoupled and uh, they, the motion takes place independent of each other in absence of an electric field ok. Ok, so let us talk about uh, the perpendicular motion. ok and what do we mean by the perpendicular motion. So, we have uh, m v x dot this is equal to uh, q v y b. So, this is uh, say equation number 1 and the equation number 2 will be m v y dot equal to minus q v x b. We are continuing with the same situation where e equal to 0 and uh, uh, b is uniform and not equal to 0 and uh, we are just uh, uh, discussing or rather deliberating upon the nature of the motion and this is quite instructive. If you take a double derivative of this, so uh, differentiate with respect to uh, with respect to time t and then of course, uh, use 2. So, then m v x double dot. So, this is equal to q uh, v y dot by b I mean into b and then I can take this m to be uh, in the denominator. Uh, this is in the denominator. So, this now I will use uh, v y dot to be here. So, this is equal to q into b by m and then this is equal to minus q into v x b uh, divided by m. So, this becomes equal to uh, minus um, q b uh, by m square and v x and uh, this is equal to uh, nothing but uh, minus uh, which we have written it earlier that omega b square v x ok or omega b is nothing but equal to uh, q b over m which we have called as the cyclotron frequency even earlier. So, just a quick recap we are uh, talking about uh, uh, no electric field and a charged particle is uh, moving with a velocity uh, v which is has components v x and v y and uh, this is um, uh, there is a B there uh, that is a magnetic field because of the magnetic field there is a low range force and in this particular case we know that the energy is constant because the f dot v equal to 0 and now we are analyzing the motion by writing down the equations of motion. So, m v x dot uh, equal to q v y b because uh, f is equal to uh, q v cross b and that is why the x component uh, or the derivative of the x component of the velocity is related to the y component of the velocity and similarly for the y component is x component, but with a negative sign. And now, I did some uh, uh, little uh, manipulation here in order to write this uh, v x double dot. Now, the end result is that the v x double dot becomes equal to minus omega b square v of x and all of you know that this corresponds to a harmonic motion 
okay, uh, where uh, V x will harmonically depend uh, on time and uh, so this is what the uh, solution is and the solution is that V x is equal to V perpendicular uh, which is uh, the because we are talking about the perpendicular motion and it is cosine of omega b t and uh, similarly if you do the same calculation for v y then v y turns out to be m divided by q b into v x dot which is equal to a minus q divided by a q and a v uh, and a sine omega t omega b t. Okay. So, this is the uh, trajectory for the perpendicular motion. So, this is the trajectory in the x direction and this is the trajectory in the y direction and why we are talking about the perpendicular because we are considering uh, a perpendicular to the magnetic field. So, if you integrate and want to know that how the trajectory looks like then uh, it will get uh, so integrating these equations we have already written a 1 and 2. So, this could be 3 and 4. So, integrating 3 and 4 and using you know some uh, initial conditions. So, x is equal to x 0 plus a v perpendicular divided by omega b uh, and a sin omega b t uh, because I integrate it with respect to t. So, this will give me uh, the x motion and uh, the y motion is uh, uh, almost similar harmonic uh, but uh, out of phase uh, by uh, an amount pi by 2 this is a cosine uh, omega b t. So, this is the x uh, motion and the y motion and it is clear that if you superpose this motion you get a circular motion and uh, let me uh, show that circular motion. Let us see how neatly I can draw a circle. Uh, not very good, but uh, this is that circular motion that we are talking about, about this point x 0 y 0. It may look slightly uh, you know uh, shifted towards the positive side, but that is not what is intended. And um, this uh, things are, so this is the radius of that. So, this is where the uh, positive q uh, motion of the particle that is uh, clockwise and this is uh, the motion when q is negative and if you want to know the you know the axis because this is very important. So, this is the x and this is the y and this is z and this is the direction of b. So, b is in the z direction and this is the planar motion. So, this is the orbit of a charged particle. Uh, about a guiding center x 0 y 0. Okay. So, uh, this is called as a guiding center this point about which the motion takes place and uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, the motion of a charged particle only in a magnetic field. So, let us uh, look at case 2 now when uh, we will talk about E not equal to 0, B not equal to 0, okay? uh, but E is perpendicular to B. Okay. So, it is basically a generalized condition of the one that we just saw and uh, we can write down the equation of motion which is F which is equal to M V dot which is equal to Q into E plus uh, v cross b. Okay. Uh, now, the total force has a component or rather a contribution coming from the electric field and um, earlier of course, uh, for E equal to 0 which is the case 1 which we saw uh, your uh, v uh, parallel was a constant. So, the parallel component of V, but now uh, uh, because of this the parallel component actually has an acceleration which is given by uh, the Q E uh, and the parallel component of E divided by M. 
so what happens is that there is no fixed guiding center that you are seeing here the guiding center remains fixed and the charge particle either in the clockwise direction or anti clockwise direction depending on its sign uh, would just move uh, around this circle but now this uh, guiding center keeps getting drifted because of the electric field let's see that okay so uh, the guiding center which was earlier we have denoted it by x0 y0 so this guiding center x0 y0 uh, it moves uh, perpendicular to both E and B. Okay. So, this guiding center moves in that direction. So, the charge particle drifts. The charge particle drifts with a velocity V d. The reason that I am writing this is that there is another component of uh, velocity or rather another contribution to the velocity which we also will have to worry about. Now, this is uh, because of the guiding center that uh, you know uh, moves in a direction which is perpendicular to both E and B, uh, the charge particle has to drift and um, this uh, drifting actually is represented by like this. and so on okay so the drift actually happens in this direction and uh, in particular suppose you have uh, b to be uh, pointing inside the screen uh, so that you know this is usually uh, represented because uh, you see an arrow uh, the back of the arrow if you see uh, it looks like a cross uh, and uh, that's why when you write it with a cross a direction which means it's going into the a plane of the paper in this case it is a plane of the board or, or this uh, white board that you are seeing and uh, we have electric field in this direction. So, one is going piercing inside uh, in, inside the board and then the other the electric field is in, in this direction and then the drift happens in a direction which is perpendicular to both which in this particular case it happens in this direction that is from left to right. Okay. So, um, how do we explain this uh, drift velocity or what is the corresponding equation that it satisfies? The drift velocity satisfies this equation which is V d cross B equal to 0. So, this is the, the net uh, force is uh, 0 and this uh, is the equation that it would satisfy and defines this V d is defined by this equation. Okay. And uh, so, how do we uh, get this? So, we can actually get uh, you can take a cross product uh, with B uh, cross product with B that gives you a 0 equal to E cross B and uh, V D cross B cross B. I am sure you can you have seen these kind of a cross product triple cross product a cross b cross c and there is a particular formula that one uses uh, which you can uh, look up and this is equal to nothing but uh, this is like a e cross b uh, and a plus a v d dot b uh, and a b here and a minus a b square and a v d. Okay. So, this is the uh, equation for this or rather this after you simplify it becomes this part and uh, then your V d becomes equal to E cross B divided by B square. Okay. So, B square you can write it with a, a square and a mod, but uh, this is also fine. So, this uh, is the drift velocity of the charge particle in presence of an uh, electromagnetic field where the electric and the magnetic fields are crossed with respect to each other that is they are perpendicular with respect to each other. All right. 
So, uh, there is also another contribution to this uh, velocity. In fact, uh, this velocity is um, coming from even if there is no E term that is the electric field term, uh, there will be a velocity due to the low range force which is what we have seen earlier. And uh, so, this let us call it as V L and this L stands for low range uh, force. So, let us call this as a low range velocity and this low range velocity can be found out by taking a d d t of these uh, orbit that we have talked about and this is like exponential i omega b t minus some initial t naught. Okay? So, this is purely because of the low range force which is uh, uh, nothing but so f l is nothing but q uh, v cross b. Okay? So, this is a uh, low range uh, velocity uh, this will get added to the, the drift velocity and uh, the net velocity will become equal to. Uh, so, it is a V uh, L plus a V D okay? um, and uh, of course, uh, because of this, um, this electric field there is also a velocity which will be there which is the parallel component of the velocity and this is the total velocity of the particle and this total velocity will, can be integrated in order to find r as a function of t. And this is done in all uh, books, classical electrodynamic books and uh, especially one can look at uh, Griffith's book on electrodynamics and it is nicely worked out there that it is actually a helix, a moving helix which uh, you know uh, sort of uh, moves uh, uh, in a direction which is uh, perpendicular to both E and B. And uh, if you have non-uniform B that uh, creates another uh, complication and in which uh, uh, maybe you will have you know the radius of the moving orbit uh, changes and so on. The reason that we have discussed is that we needed to understand the trajectory of the uh, charged particle and uh, we are uh, really dealing with electrons uh, in an electromagnetic field or in a magnetic field. So, uh, and these electrons are um, governed by laws of quantum mechanics and uh, we will have to do a, a quantum mechanical treatment of this problem uh, and the finally the problem would lead to uh, giving us this uh, quantum Hall effect or the integer quantum Hall effect uh, which I showed you um, even uh, at the beginning of the discussion today. All right. So, uh, let me um, sort of do a quantum mechanics. Now, this is of course, a large number of electrons involved, but uh, they are mostly semiconductors or metals that we are talking about and they have electrons which the large number of electrons being there, but still uh, the interparticle interaction can still be ignored. So, you can uh, talk about them as free electrons uh, and uh, we, uh, the Drude theory would uh, uh, explain their uh, the conductivities and the resistivities as we have talked about. Let us write down a quantum mechanics of a charged particle. And first, let us uh, do it only for the magnetic field and uh, we will see that the physics is not um, radically altered when you include the electric field. Uh, there are some um, ramifications of that uh, which we will uh, talk about. Okay? And how do we do this problem? Since we are talking about single charge particle because the, um, the electronic interactions can be neglected here. Uh, they are weakly interacting or they are not interacting at all, uh, we can solve a Schrodinger equation in presence of a magnetic field. So, how does one solve uh, a Schrodinger equation in presence of a magnetic field? So, let us write down the Schrodinger equation in its simplest form. It is minus h square by 2 m uh, and del square and a v of uh, say r uh, and this r is uh, well there is a psi here. Uh, which is a function of r and this is a function of r and this if you write it the time independent Schrodinger equation then this is a formula or rather this is the equation that you need to solve 
and you have solved it in a variety of situations in which uh, you had uh, say a, the particle in a box say for example, in which V r equal to 0 uh, inside the box and it is uh, equal to infinity at the walls or rather outside the box it is infinity which means that the particle cannot escape uh, or you have done a problem in which these are uh, finite steps or they are finite wells or they are finite barrier or they are infinite uh, barrier such as a delta function barrier and so on and so forth which are all uh, part of the quantum mechanics course first course on quantum mechanics that you have learned. Now, we are going to solve the same problem and uh, we are uh, going to put this equal to 0 because we uh, claim uh, rather uh, assert that there is no interaction that uh, needed to be taken into account uh, even if it is there it is very small and can be ignored. And now, uh, you have to somehow include the presence of the magnetic field ok. And uh, if you remember that the magnetic field uh, for a particle charged particle uh, that enters through the momentum. So, the, uh, the momentum uh, which is written as P which was without uh, any magnetic field or uh, any other thing is equal to m into v which is called as a mechanical momentum. This thing changes into in presence of a magnetic field this is uh, p minus e a. So, it, it this changes from p to p minus q a where q is the charge and a is the vector potential and this vector potential is an important quantity and we know that uh, the b actually is uh, uh, given by curl of a ok. So, this fixes the gauge. Now, why I say a gauge because uh, you know when b is perpendicular that is in the z direction then a can be either in the x direction or can be in the y direction or can be uh, in uh, any of x and y direction. Uh, I mean it is in a direction which is perpendicular to the z direction ok. So, say uh, you, you have asserted that b is in the z direction ok. So, the understanding is that we have uh, a, a sort of planar charges. Uh, so, there are charges here ok um, and which is uh, you know a material like this say for example, a thin material uh, and uh, there is a magnetic field which is perpendicular and acting in the z direction. So, this is the z direction. All right. So, uh, so B is equal to uh, B z cap. In that case, A can be equal to you know uh, minus B y that is the x component 0 0. It, it can also be 0 B x 0 and uh, it can also be you know half equal to half uh, R cross B um, and uh, uh, this is for a constant magnetic field. So, this is equal to uh, like B y by 2 or minus B x by 2 and 0 ok. So, these are B into y and B into x ok. So, all three forms of the vector potential would create the same B uh, which is in the which is constant and in the z direction you just have to convince yourself by taking the curl of this and um, uh, so these are called gauge freedom you know I mean in the sense that it the final result would not depend upon which a you use ok. And this a is also you can add or subtract say for example, you can add a gradient of a scalar quantity and uh, uh, see this scalar quantity uh, does not matter because when you take a curl of this a curl of a gradient would always be 0 and uh, you can understand it in this particular fashion that a gradient has a particular direction in space in which you ask this question 
that if lambda is a scalar quantity, say it is like a, a heat density or something or there is a sound wave that are or sound field that are produced because of some loudspeakers and so on and uh, they are placed in four corners of the room and you may want to ask this question that in which direction the sound intensity changes the fastest and in which case you have to find the gradient in which it changes the fastest and that gradient is actually a direction and because it is a direction if you take a curl of a particular direction it has to give you 0. That is why uh, there are these uh, choices of A along with this uh, minus gradient of lambda that uh, these are called the gate choices. Finally, the results that you get uh, are physical results, physical observables. So, they would not depend upon which choice of A you have taken or whether uh, what choice of lambda you have taken and it uh, the res final result would not depend upon that all right. So, uh, let us take this gauge as let us fix the gauge to be equal to A x equal to that is the x component of A is minus B y. So, A is equal to. So, the first choice that we have talked about let us take that, but it really does not matter ok and this is called as a Landau gauge. Okay. So, we do this and then put this in the uh, Schrodinger equation and now make sure that your uh, Q is nothing but minus E because we are talking about electrons specifically. So, we will have this equation which is 1 over 2 m because it is a p square over 2 m. So, we have a p x minus E uh, b y by uh, square uh, and uh, plus a p y square over 2 m and a plus p z square over 2 m. You can actually put uh, the 2 m outside, maybe let us do that so that I do not have to write these uh, ok. And this the only thing and then this psi is equal to E psi is the equation. So, this is a Schrodinger equation. that you have to solve ok. Now, it is very clear that uh, the motion in the z direction is exactly like a free particle, it is just like uh, a particle in a box and that direction is quantized and in fact, it, uh, it really uh, does not matter if you are talking about uh, perfectly two dimensional electron, the z component uh, cannot be there, even if it is there it is quantized. So, uh, the electron cannot escape in the z direction because we are talking about a two dimensional uh, problem. So, uh, that problem then uh, let us uh, eliminate the z part of the kinetic energy or this p z square over 2 m and let us simply write it as uh, uh, like a 1 over 2 m and then the p x minus e b y whole square plus a p y square and so on psi is equal to. Now, this psi is a function of x and y only and this is equal to let us talk about an energy let us let us say that is uh, uh, denoted by epsilon psi of x y. I hope you understood that why uh, p x minus e b y is written because uh, the uh, vector potential is assumed to be only present uh, in the x direction. So, it is p minus E a or p plus E a rather uh, because p minus q a. So, p plus E a uh, that a has only x component. So, only the p x changes and nothing uh, else the p y remains as it is ok. Now, this is of course, a two dimensional Hamiltonian you can call it some h uh, x y. So, if you write it symbolically it is like h x y psi x y equal to epsilon psi x y and this is what you have to solve for. So, you have to solve for the Eigen solutions and the Eigen solutions are nothing but the psi x y um, and um, uh, the energies are epsilon is, uh, are the two things that one has to solve for ok. There is something interesting that happens here 
uh, if you want to ask that uh, which component of the momentum is conserved, uh, then uh, it is easy to see that this P x and H x y is conserved. And the reason is that uh, there is no x variable here. Had there been an x variable, then the, there would be no commutation between uh, P x and H, but because we have decided to take the uh, vector potential in the in the x direction and with a by that's why it uh, this p x is uh, commutes with the hamiltonian and uh, from elementary quantum mechanics as you know that if an operator commutes with the hamiltonian then the corresponding quantum number remains conserved or uh, there are quantities that remain conserved here of course the p x uh, that is the x component of the momentum remains conserved and the, uh, the quantum uh, number or the sort of a quantity that remains conserved is called as a kx. Okay? So, kx is h cross kx. So, px is equal to constant uh, which tells you that h cross kx is equal to uh, constant. Okay? So, h cross kx is constant. And now, this kx, uh, because we are talking about a quantum mechanical problem, this kx is quantized as uh, 2 pi over uh, you know uh, nx divided by lx. Okay? It is just that, uh, just the way we have learned that uh, the particle in a box, the k vectors are quantized, the k vectors are quantized uh, uh, because of the presence of boundaries there. And that is uh, we have seen that k equal to you know n pi over l uh, here because of the uh, periodic boundary condition you get a factor of 2. So, this kx uh, is equal to 2 pi nx by lx and nx are 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. Okay? So, these are the values that are uh, sorry the 0 uh, can be neglected because uh, 0 means that the particle is not there. So, it is actually 1, 2, 3 and so on. Okay, so, any integer. The rest of the uh, relation can be written as, so if Px is a constant, I can absorb it as a constant in the Hamiltonian and can write down the resultant uh, Schrodinger equation as follows. Okay, so, this is equal to uh, Py square over 2m. Py is not conserved for the reason there is a y in the Hamiltonian and Py and y do not commute. This is the uncertainty principle that you have learnt uh, and uh, particularly y and p y is equal to i h cross. Okay? This reason that p y is not constant and I can write down then this uh, 1 by 2 uh, I, that is half m and e b over m square and y minus y 0 square and now my wave function actually becomes function of only one variable that is y because you see there is no x anywhere in the uh, Hamiltonian. So, I can write this as simply f of y and this is equal to e epsilon and f of y. Okay? And what is the uh, y0? y0 is uh, the constant thing which is px over eb and uh, this p x is the x component of the momentum which I s argued that y it is constant and of course, for a given problem E and B are constants, uh, B is a uniform field. So, this y 0 is actually p x by E B and this is uh, it has a name called as a magnetic length and written as L B because it depends on B. Okay. Now, this uh, tells you that if this is a constant, uh, there is a p y square and then there is a half something m into some uh, cyclotron frequency. So, it is a half m omega square and then y minus y 0 square and then you have this uh, wave function which is only a function of y and that is why from psi x y we have written it f of y and then energy into f of y and this clearly represents uh, that the equation for or the Schrodinger equation for a harmonic oscillator oscillating in the y direction about not about 0, 
but about this y0 or the magnetic length which is given by this uh, px over eb okay so uh, if it is a, a harmonic oscillator problem then we don't need to solve any further we can uh, get this uh, the solution to be exactly of the form which is epsilon equal to n plus half h cross omega b where omega b is equal to uh, of course omega b is equal to e b over m which we have said several times that this is equal to the cyclotron frequency ok. So, a problem which was simple enough to begin with uh, we find the solution at least till now we have found the energy. So, the energy is nothing but it is uh, n plus half h cross omega b just following the solution for the energy for a harmonic oscillator n can have 0, 1, 2, 3 etcetera all the integers and here it can be equal to 0 because uh, the harmonic oscillator allows for a solution with a quantum number n equal to 0. So, uh, this is the uh, energy or the eigenvalues of the problem. Let us see the eigenfunction. So, the eigenfunction now let us call it uh, because we, we can solve for of course, uh, f of y uh, that is what we will do, but then we know that the total wave function which is equal to f of or psi of x y psi of x y is actually a free particle in the x direction multiplied by this f of y ok. This is the uh, total wave function for the planar motion of the electron that is in the x direction if you take this as the x direction it propagates like a free particle because uh, p x is constant or k x is constant. So, it will uh, propagate like a, a free wave there and will have a harmonic motion in the y direction. So, in the y direction it will have a harmonic motion uh, will make a execute a harmonic motion about a point which is given by uh, y 0 and this y 0 inversely depend upon b ok. So, uh, this is nothing but uh, I use a normalization uh, for the x direction uh, box normalization uh, this is equal to exponential i k x x and uh, now I do not try to normalize it, it is not you know required here. I use this as a normalization constant and use the this uh, ok. So, let me write the normalization not with a capital N because you have a small n uh, this thing there. So, let us write it with a, a, a n. So, a n is a normalization constant and the wave functions are uh, for a harmonic oscillator are known to be a convolution of a Gaussian which is exponential minus alpha x square or alpha y square multiplied by a polynomial function which is called as a Hermite polynomial and this polynomial has a property that when n is even the polynomial is even that is it contains terms such as x to the power 0, x, x square, x to the power 4 and so on when n is odd it contains terms which are x, x cube, x to the power 5 and so on. So, this is that form that we have to write down. So, this is equal to uh, E b y minus y 0 whole square divided by h cross which is the Gaussian part. Just reminding you that uh, this is the harmonic oscillator and uh, you have a, a Gaussian like this for the for the ground state and and this is for the first excited state it is like this and so on ok. So, this is an odd function. So, this is a ground state and this is the first excited state and so on. So, and then there is a Hermite polynomial and this Hermite polynomial is written as E b y minus y 0. Uh, divided by h cross etcetera. The exact form is not important for us at this moment, but we need to know that at least this there is a Hermite polynomial and then there is a Gaussian term which comes with a normalization constant and this part is purely because of the x part and this is because of the y. 
and as I said uh, that the z component even if you consider it is like a free particle in the z direction. In particular if you confine electrons in two dimension uh, then that uh, term does not arise. Now if you go to this uh, last slide you have n plus half h cross omega and this n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 etc. these are called as the Landau levels. So, the energy levels have a name which are called as the Landau levels and uh, Landau is a Russian physicist and uh, the wave function is actually a freely propagating part in the x direction multiplied by a harmonic part which is uh, executing a harmonic oscillation uh, which has a Gaussian term and a Hermite polynomial uh, n when n is even the polynomial is even when n is odd the polynomial is odd. Okay. These Landau levels so if, if we really plot it how does it look like the Landau levels will simply look like this. Okay. They are equidistant okay, for a given value of b. So, this is uh, say n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2 and so on. Uh, but if you draw for another magnetic field it may look like this and so on. Okay. So, then n equal to 1 n equal to 2, n equal to 3 and so on. Okay. And the reason is that uh, omega b uh, which is um, the cyclotron frequency it is directly proportional to b. So, as you increase b let us say that this b 1 for a magnetic field b 1 and this is for a for b 2 and of course, B2 is greater than B1. Okay. And these are called as the Landau levels. So, uh, now what are the properties of the Landau levels? And uh, we would uh, eventually get to that that these Landau levels are the most important things in understanding the structure of the plateaus. Okay. And uh, these are not really very sharp levels because of disorder this get broadened uh, we will come to that. There is one uh, very important things that these Landau levels are infinitely degenerate or the degeneracy is very high. So, degeneracy of the Landau levels. So, there are many many states corresponding to each one of the n values. So, n equal to 0 has very large number of states which means that these states can be occupied by electrons. So, each Landau level is occupied by many many electrons. So, let us understand the how that degeneracy arises and where does it come from. It comes from the value that k x is a constant and this result that you have got is independent of uh, k x. So, k x does not play a role here which means any value of kx would give rise to this level and this kx has a nx associated with it which denote the quantum number of the states which means that corresponding to any value of n here a given value of n there could be a very large number of values of nx that are possible. Okay. So, uh, it is in principle this is infinite but uh, the degeneracy is actually limited by some factors and uh, let us uh, you know try to understand that what factors do they depend upon. But I hope that it is clear uh, that these uh, levels are heavily degenerate and the degeneracy is because they are uh, coming from the fact that any value of kx would satisfy this equation or any value of nx would satisfy these energy levels. So, each of the energy levels do not depend upon on uh, nx and any value would be then acceptable solution. Okay. So, uh, if we want to know the degeneracy let us uh, look at this. Okay. So, uh, we have written this down earlier that the y0 is equal to, so we have uh, y0 equal to p x over e b, we have written this earlier uh, and which we called as l b which is the magnetic length and this is nothing but h cross k x uh, divided by e b okay, because p x is h cross k x 
and this is equal to h cross um, uh, kx is 2 pi uh, uh, nx by lx. Okay. So, this is your uh, y0 and we want to find that what is the maximum degeneracy. So, we want to find what is nx max okay. and nx max all others are constant the y0 is the is basically a length scale in the y direction okay. along the y direction there is some value of y which is determined by of course the magnetic field. Now, this y0 can at the most be L y that is the uh, length of the sample in the y direction that y0 cannot be outside the sample. So, the maximum value of y0 will be L y and so maximum value of n x max can be obtained if you substitute y0 as L y. So, this is equal to E b uh, L x L y. Uh, because I am putting y0 as uh, ly and this is equal to 2 pi uh, h cross. So, that is the maximum degeneracy. So, this is equal to E b into a, a is the area of the sample, uh, do not uh, confuse it with anything else, it is the a is the area of the sample. And uh, divided by this h because 2 pi h cross is nothing but h, I can write this as a divided by h over uh, e and uh, so I can I can take that b uh, this thing I mean I can leave that b there and put this electronic charge uh, below the uh, in the denominator uh, because h over e is a very important quantity which is called as a flux quantum. which is denoted by some phi 0. Okay. So, this is equal to a flux quantum which has a particular value um, in Weber uh, some 10 to the power minus 14, 10 to the power minus 15 uh, value. So, you see that let us call this as g the degeneracy. So, g is equal to uh, it depends on the, the b the magnetic field the area of the sample and a phi 0 and this tells you that this degeneracy can be infinite because a b if you go back to the first slide that we had and you see here the magnetic field goes all the way up to 14, 15 tesla. So, this is about 15 tesla. So, there is a 15 tesla magnetic field if you want if you have facilities you can increase that magnetic field even more. So, and the sample size is up to you. Okay. So, this is really a very large degeneracy that is coming out of each one of the Landau levels are degenerate. In fact, this has uh, important um, repercussions or impl implications on uh, the qu fractional quantum Hall effect. Okay, so, two things that we notice here. So, you note that uh, the degeneracy is of course, what I told you that uh, degeneracy is proportional to Uh, is proportional to b and a. Uh, I told you b is the magnetic field and a is the area and um, the second is that uh, you know uh, the trajectory uh, can be uh, um, the trajectory is centered about some y0. Uh, is uh, SHM in y direction? and centered about y0. So, uh, these are two very important you know uh, outcome of this exercise that we have done that is we have solved uh, a charge particle a single charge particle uh, in presence of a perpendicular or a transverse magnetic field. We have taken a particular gauge and suppose we have taken the gauge in which uh, the magnetic vector potential is in the y direction. In that case, you will have just the x and y being interchanged that the system the, the particle will propagate like a free particle in the y direction and will execute a simple harmonic oscillation in the 
x direction. So, x and y uh, they have no specific significance and uh, the third gauge which we will talk about later it is called as a, a spherical gauge or symmetric gauge and in that case you have both x and y component and these Landau levels are actually found out to be circular. Okay. So, um, now there are uh, some incidental similarities which I will just point out and we will discuss them uh, as we go along and the similarities are that the Hall resistivity it shows plateaus in multiples of h over uh, these plateaus are h over e square. Okay, so, h over say n e square or something where n is an integer. Okay. So, uh, consider to be n 0. Okay, that is the density of carriers. So, define a quantity called as nu or uh, let us call this as uh, just what we called here as n let me call this as nu where nu takes values 1, 2, 3 etcetera. We just change this because the too many n's n is used for density as well. So, consider charge density of the of the carriers to be n 0. So, nu is defined as n 0 divided by uh, g by a. Now, this g by a is the, uh, the degeneracy per unit area. So, let us not uh, have the geometry of the sample coming in because you can have any, any geometry, but if you divide it by a then it becomes a fundamental quantity which only depends on the value of the magnetic field. And we are now we are talking about a, a given value of the magnetic field and uh, this is equal to nothing but uh, n 0 h divided by e b and uh, this is equal to. So, this is equal to a number of electrons and I can I can write this as n 0 divided by h over e into b. So, that is the flux quantum. Uh, so, this is number of electrons and divided by the uh, you know the number of uh, flux quanta. and so on. Okay. So, if nu assumes a value integer that is when the number of electrons uh, and the number of flux quanta they become commensurate fractions or even uh, fractions uh, in the fractional quantum Hall effect then there are plateaus uh, that are seen in the resistivity. Okay. So, these uh, depending upon now you, you tune in the value of the magnetic field go back to this uh, first slide which we had you see the magnetic field is being continuously tuned from a value 0 to 15 tesla. So, magnetic field is continuously ramped up and you are doing this experiment and what you see is that when this quantity which we just found out that this quantity becomes an integer then there are these Hall plateaus which are seen which we saw last. So, when this becomes an integer you have a plateau which means that this ratio becomes an integer uh, you see plateaus. Then you again tune b this goes uh, uh, from being an integer to uh, a fraction then you no longer see plateau and then this thing uh, the resistivity gives shows a jump and then you go to the next integer such that it, it shows another plateau and that is how this uh, new actually would uh, be uh, you know uh, sort of it will go from one uh, integer value to another integer value and it will pull along uh, the resistivity of the material to be having plateaus um, and, and so on and uh, from one plateau to another. And this is what we are going to see more carefully. I will give you a list of references that uh, uh, you uh, should follow. Uh, some of them are advanced references and um, you can follow them along with my lectures here. Uh, some of them are of the same level 
um, offhand I do not remember them, but next uh, discussion I will uh, provide the, you with those references. Mm -hmm.